COVID-19 has hit seniors hard, and not just in long-term care settings. For the vast majority of seniors who live independently in their own homes, it's the months of social distancing and staying apart from family that have been extremely hard. And for many, it's taking an emotional, mental, and physical toll. Are such sacrifices doing more harm than good? Let's find out as we ask. In Ontario's capital city, from Mount Sinai Hospital, Dr. Leslie Weisenfeld. She's psychiatrist in chief for Sinai Health. And Dr. Nathan Stahl, a geriatrician at the hospital and research fellow at the University of Toronto. And in Calgary, Alberta, journalist Christina Frangu, who specializes in writing about health and recently wrote about this for Maclean's. And we're thankful that all three of you could join us on TVO tonight. And Christina, I do want to start with you because in your recent piece, and I guess I'll, I'll ask our director, Sheldon Osmond, to bring this picture up. This is, um, boy, that picture is just haunting. And for those who are listening on podcast and who can't see it, it's an elderly gentleman, I'm going to guess, in, in his late 80s, uh, with a pained expression on his face, hand over his mouth and chin, and he just looks... Well, go ahead, Christina, you describe it. Well, this is George Spaulding, and George is actually 96 in this photo. Oh, my gosh. Well, he looks fantastic then. Yeah, he does. We should all be so lucky as to be in the shape George is at 96. And this photo, um, he is looking out the window at his daughter who is standing outside. She took the photo. You see her reflected in the bottom of the photo. Yes. She's standing in the wet grass. Um, George has gray-blue eyes and wrinkled forehead and he, this photo was taken during the summer. George has been living in a retirement home in Ontario for the last five years. He moved in with his wife, Grace, and, and they, he wasn't really ready to move in, but Grace's health wasn't, wasn't wonderful. And a few weeks after they moved in, Grace passed away. And so George was on his own and his kids were very worried about how George was gonna do. He was a lifelong outdoorsman uh, he'd been actually chopping wood for their, their home up until they moved in. So at age 91, he was still chopping wood. And he only stopped because it was hard on, on Grace's lungs to have the, the stove going in their house. Hmm. So he's in there by himself and his kids are worried. And he did great. He flourished. He's, he's a real social butterfly. So he'd go to all the dances and bingo. And he's very active. He told me that he estimates he walks about half a mile every day going to his meals and back and then when COVID struck and the focus was really on getting PPEs in hospitals George's retirement home like so many across the country went into lockdown and so he stayed in his apartment there was no more shared meals in the dining hall so his meals were delivered and George had a chronic cough and so he was um, identified as a possible case of COVID he couldn't get testing at that time. And so meals were just dropped off outside his door by someone in masks. He brought the tray in, ate, and put it back outside. And he went two weeks without seeing anybody. And he, he, he just stopped eating. And he said to me, you just don't need so much food when you're not being very active. And George ended up in the hospital in June. And that's where this photo was taken. His family couldn't get in to see him initially. And when this photo was taken, he said to his daughter, I don't want to go back to the apartment. And George, like 40,000 other Canadians, is on a wait, was on a wait list for a long time to get into long-term care. And his family was in the quandary that so many Canadian families find themselves. What do you do? Do they keep paying for his apartment? Do they um, leave him in convinced them to leave him in hospital. And finally, they brought him home. They decided that would be best, brought him home to his, his apartment. And he just never quite bounced back. His kids were allowed to come visit, so they would visit, but he still had to have his meals on his own. And George passed away in hospital at the end of July. And do you think, I mean, you're not a doctor, obviously, but you can tell us what, what those who knew him and who cared for him said. You think he died of loneliness? I don't know if he died of loneliness, but his last months were very lonely for him. And when I talked to him about what he wanted, he, he said, you know, this virus is serious and we have to, we, we have to respond to this. And, and he said, you know, this isn't the toughest thing I've ever gone through. 
um, he had actually been in a, a quarantine because of a mumps outbreak when he was in, in the army living in a barracks in Ontario when his first son was born and he didn't get to see him for several weeks. But he just missed having people around and dancing and meals and he just didn't want to continue. Nathan Stahl, how, reflect is, how reflective is George's story of your experience with older people? It's tragically far too common. Um, you know, we see a lot of older uh, patients who have lived through traumatic experiences earlier in life, whether it's the Holocaust, whether it's world wars. And at the beginning, the common refrain was, you know, we've lived through these experiences, we can live through COVID. And as the month wore on, this was quite a chronic experience of isolation and loneliness. Many of them told me, um, we've lived through that, but this is no way to die. Um, and, you know, I've seen so many uh, older adults and I've heard from families and caregivers uh, about experiences like George, where as the months wore on and uh, older adults were isolated and lonely in the way that they were, there was accelerated cognitive decline. So many people went, particularly in the congregate care settings like long-term care and retirement homes where uh, after the lockdown was eased in many jurisdictions across the country, caregivers went back in and their loved one may not have recognized them anymore. Uh, I've seen people who went from walking to wheelchair bound and from requiring help with a few activities to complete their daily activities, but uh, that progressed to being fully dependent. And then of course there's tragic cases like George where they sort of dwindled over the course of this pandemic and ended up tragically dying. So I have no doubt that when we, when all is said and done and when we have all the data and we mostly have the data thus far on COVID-19 deaths, that we are gonna see uh, another toll of this pandemic, which is this toll of uh, loneliness and social isolation and the impact of the conditions of the pandemic, not just the deaths from COVID-19 itself. Leslie Weisenfeld, what are you seeing and what are you experiencing in your practice? Thank you. Um, and I think that what, I, what I've really been seeing and I've been thinking about is what I might describe as kind of the psychological and also the psychiatric. I think the psychological impact is interesting because there's so many people who are kind of 70 something and above who didn't really think of themselves as frail and vulnerable and you know I think we all realize so much of the messaging initially around from you know from public uh, health uh, officials which was so important around guidance and safety it really highlighted to so many people that they were in this kind of group that needed to be so fearful so afraid and so what I've seen is this sort of psychological experience of older adults who might have seen themselves, as Christina described, as really vital, really, you know, kind of active, who then needed to think of themselves as the most vulnerable and, you know, and really kind of impacted their self-concept in a way that, you know, has been, you know, really sad as you, as we, and, and as Dr. Stahl and I both work together, we, you know, we spend so much of our work trying to empower older adults and help them to feel, you know, vibrant and as active as they can. And it's nobody's fault. It's just the effect of, of some of the direction, especially in the early days. And so I've seen this sort of psychological, almost like involution, this kind of withdrawal that's happened for older adults um, around their, you know, self-esteem, their sense of mortality, their sense of trying to balance like their physical health and their mental health. And I think so much of the messaging really privileged, understandably, their physical health in a way that made people feel really small and really fearful. And then I think on the psychiatric side, what I've seen, you know, is that it's really, really hard for people who are getting more mentally unwell to access care. You know, as many of us have talked about, one of the great things about psychiatry is you can do it virtually, like the way we're doing this, this conversation, but you can only do virtual care with people who can do virtual care with you. And so many older adults are marginalized, you know, they can't access, you know, kind of technology. And that's not meant to say that there aren't older adults who are very savvy. There are, but there are lots of people who are, who were marginalized before this, who can't access social supports, let alone psychiatric support. So it's like a double hit in terms of their, their well-being. Hmm. Christina, we pointed out earlier that you wrote about this for McLean's a couple of weeks ago, and I want to read an excerpt from that article uh, just to set up our next point of discussion. From the beginning, you wrote, there's been one constant with COVID. There's never a painless option. Living with the virus always involves some kind of taboo trade-off, staying home or going into work, hugging grandchildren or keeping a virus at bay allowing spouses to visit or shutting the doors of long-term care to anyone who might bring in an illness. But somewhere in those trade-offs, individuals 
have the right to make choices about their lives. Well, th th this really gets to the nub of a very complicated issue, which obviously decision makers are dealing with and families are dealing with, and that is, um, well, partly, is the, is the cure for COVID worse than the disease itself? And, and have decision makers taken the ability of families to make their own decisions out of their hands in the interest of broader public interest? Uh, why don't we get into some of that? Christina, what can, what can you tell us on those two scores? I think we're failing our older adults when we talk about this in really black and white terms, that the only options are isolation or not. And, and that's simply not the case. Um, we have a lot of things we can do as, as families and as, as communities to help out older Canadians and, and to support them. And so one of the things that uh, Dr. Samir Sinha had said to me is that this is a conversation we don't get to make for our grandparents or our parents. This is a conversation that decision we make with them. And we sit and talk to them about what is important. Think of it, what, what I found really helpful was to say, think of this as a kind of advanced care planning. Like we often think of advanced care planning about as something you do at the, for the very end of life about what I would do for someone I love if they could no longer speak for themselves. But we're talking about a quality of life issue here. And so sit down and talk to people about what really matters to them. Is it most important to my parents that they have visits from their kids and their grandparents? And if so, how can we as a family have that conversation about how to do that as safely as possible for them? And maybe it means that I don't go out and, and spend my nights in, in, in restaurants or in pubs or whatever else, but my most important priority in my life is making sure that I get to see my parents and do that in a way that's safe for them. Yeah, Dr. Stoll, we, we, I think we know that about two-thirds of the deaths in the province of Ontario have happened to older people who are living in long-term care settings. So obviously, that's a crisis, and obviously we want to do everything we can to protect those people from dying. Having said that, I do want to ask you the question directly. Do you think that we have, not we, but I guess the decision-makers, have gone overboard in the cure for what ails us at the moment? Yeah, it's a tough question. Um, you know, what really turned my head around was in June, a group of French long-term care physicians wrote an article in, in one of the long-term care journals. And the title of the article was, uh, The Confinement Syndrome May Be Worse Than COVID-19 Itself. And they noticed that th they actually termed this confinement syndrome, which is a term appropriated from other conditions of confinement, solitary confinement, in fact. Uh, and they noticed some of the things we described up front, that that older adults in these settings, which had endured months of conditions like George had endured, um, were really uh, not thriving and, in fact, were experiencing the deteriorations we noticed. Now, you know, when, when a lot of the visitor restrictions were imposed on congregate living settings, and that would have been in the province of Ontario on March 14th, I think that was probably a reasonable thing to do. This was an intensifying catastrophe. The long-term care setting sector was clearly unprepared to deal with it, and they needed a blunt response. The challenge and the issue was that this lasted far longer than I think it needed to last. And, you know, as the rest of society started to open up over the summertime in the province of Ontario and across the country, we kept residents uh, in these settings in conditions of lockdown uh, well through the summertime, well uh, into while well, restaurants, bars, and other settings were open. And older adults are less able to tolerate the deprivation that they uh, were experiencing in some ways. So many of them, without the ability to, for example, go outside for walks, many of them experience that functional decline. To the credit of the province in Ontario, um, they actually recognized uh, this, and I would argue um, created one of the more um, compassionate and balanced visitor policies by distinguishing in early September between the types of people who want to access the homes, uh, meaning that there are people who are coming for social reasons to visit people, but there are also family caregivers who prior to the pandemic were coming in multiple times a day often to feed residents, to help them with basic activities of daily living. The province of Ontario now allows residents or their substitute decision makers to designate two family caregivers who can enter the home 
without serious restrictions on limits or frequency of access, and even during times of outbreak, which I think is the type of balance and nuance in the policies we need to be pursuing when we think about older adults so that we can both protect them from the disease, but also not cause untoward harm by overly severe restrictions. Mm -hmm. Dr. Weisenfeld, do you think the, the quote unquote blunt response has been too blunt? Oh boy. I mean, it seems almost too easy to be critical, but I, you know, I have a few thoughts. I, you know, I think that, you know, we need to add probably more empathy into some of the public health communications, more that kind of acknowledges, as Christina was saying, that there are nuanced and kind of balanced decisions that need to be made to help people to decide amongst risks. You know, I think the challenge, you know, is, you know, if I think about it, even myself, I, you know, I wear a lot of hats. I work in a hospital where people are working really, really hard to get ready for people who may need more help related to COVID positive illness and are really attentive to this kind of balance around restrictions that will help keep the healthcare system running um, and also be able to kind of provide care uh, in a safe way. You know, as Dr. Stahl said, we're trying to balance around visitor policy in a humane way that's empathetic, as well as trying to make sure that we keep people in our hospital, including our staff members, safe. I do think that, you know, whether it's because people had optimism that it would only be a short period of time, which I think Dr. Stahl is right about, um, or whether it's because people were so worried that if they didn't give guidance that was, too, that was you know, blunt enough that people wouldn't follow it. I mean, it's easy to look back and all of us have, you know, more ideas about what we wish would have been true. I think, I think though, that what we're probably all saying, if I can speak for my colleagues on the, on the conversation, is that we need something that is maybe um, a little more attentive that a senior citizen or an older adult is a grown up, you know, is a person who has lived a life, um, has reflections on their values, has reflections on meaning and what they hope for. Um, and I think what's happened is, you know, older people being considered in a bubble has also taken away their voice around being able to have really important conversations about what they look for in their quality of life, not about going beyond the restrictions, but within them being able to have really important conversations with their family members about what's important to them. Um, and, and I think also empowering their kids to not just frame it as like, I would feel terrible if something happened to you, mom, but allowing an, an older parent to say, but let me tell you what would make me feel terrible. What would make me feel terrible is not to see you, not to be able to wear a mask and maybe sit six feet apart and have a conversation. And I think it's been a bit one way from the beginning. And I think we need to make it a two way conversation. Hmm. We started our conversation talking about George Spalding, who's from Cochrane, Ontario, in Northern Ontario. And now, Christina, I would like you to tell us about Diane Parker from Halifax and what your takeaway from her story was. So she's another person I spoke with for this story, and she's a retired rector. So she no longer manages her own parish, but she still does funerals and weddings. And she has been a longtime advocate in Halifax, speaking out against isolation of seniors. And she has so much energy and when beginning in march you know she went sort of into to lockdown all her services were moved online and she worked with her community to try and find ways to make sure that she was connected and she she was adamant that people have a choice um, in, in how they connect with people. And so she has the photo there you see with her happy stick and she used that to pass baked goods to her neighbors who live nearby. Now, I just, I'm going to jump in here for, for a sec, Christina, because for people listening on podcast who aren't going to know what a happy stick is or what she's doing, you better describe what's happening in that picture. <laughs> so you see a woman with white hair standing on her porch holding out this stick that looks like a long cane. It's, it's two meters long, I think, and she's passing a bag across to another um balcony where there's a family standing there waiting to receive the, the gifts of whatever's in the bag. So that's the way to do it when you have to be socially distanced, right? Yes. And she also, yeah. she would set up these elaborate window displays um, around Easter. And I'm sure she has something in the works for Christmas. She has a clown ministry uh, under normal conditions. And, and so during COVID, she, you know, dressed up as a clown and walked around her neighborhood to make the kids laugh. Um, and she uh, built a lower deck to her front porch that she calls her COVID deck. And so she could sit on the top level and someone could sit at the bottom level and they could sit outside and have a chat while being socially distant. Well, she has clearly figured out how to roll with the punches during this COVID-19 <laughs> yeah. era. Uh, Nathan Stahl, I guess I'd like to find out from you, 
uh, some other alternatives. What are some other ideas that you're hearing or seeing where people can overcome the loneliness and yet still respect the, the health care protocols at the same time? Yeah, I think what we're getting at here is, and it's important to recognize this, that the older adult population is not homogeneous, right? So the things that that worked for uh, this rector in, in Halifax in terms of virtual connectivity uh, and, and creating additional space may not work for everyone. So when we create policy, we have to take into account that a one-size-fits-all solution may not work. Let me jump back to long-term care retirement homes uh, for a second here. One of the things that I have seen as a more creative solution to this is recognizing that transmission of COVID-19 um, is greatly reduced in outdoor settings. The province of Manitoba, for example, um, where I was born, actually built all season visitation structures outdoors so that people can come visit their loved ones in a uh, climate somewhat controlled setting outdoors. They're actually reappropriating shipping containers. Um, and that's a way to have connectivity give residents hope that they can still connect with their loved ones um, a little bit closer than through windows and not have visitor traffic coming through the home. So I think that there are ways that we can do this. It just takes some will and, and sometimes it takes some money and we need to prioritize this for older adults, recognizing that without the social interaction uh, and the other needs that need to be met for older adults, we will see the decline that we have in the past. Nathan, is that going to work when it's minus 25 in Winnipeg in February? <laughs> well, Win Winnipeggers do all sorts of uh, interesting things in the wintertime, right? Whether it's running or skating, they're pretty used to the inclement uh, weather. Um, we'll see. Uh, you know, they actually started constructing these and thinking about this in June, right? So this was something they thought about in the summertime, recognizing that winter was coming. They have done these outdoor visitation uh, structures or booths in other settings as well. And I think that's one creative solution that, that could have an impact on residents' lives. Hmm. Leslie, I wonder, I mean, in a strange way, when you're talking about people, for example, who are in their 90s, when you talk about long-term impacts, you know, there, there isn't necessarily anything long-term about anything when you're in your 90s. But having said that, uh, as you think about how that generation is going to deal with all of what it has dealt with over the last eight, nine months, what comes to mind? Oh boy. Um, you know, I, I think that, you know, we've all been reflecting the last several months about how long this has gone on and what an imprint it's having. I think fair to say for a very older person, it's one of many things that they'll reflect on as kind of a thing they lived through, wouldn't have imagined, um, and got through to the other side of. Um, I do think that for a very older adult, you know, I think that, um, they will do what people have always done. People integrate, you know, kind of challenging and traumatic experience into, you know, kind of their own sense of wisdom. As, as corny as that may sound, it's been a fact ever since people lived through wars and famines and other disasters. Um, and I, I think if I can just add, if you don't mind, to even the, the question that you were asking of, of Nathan, that I think the other thing people will do, and I hope they will do, is they will, rather than wait for some of the restrictions to be over, they will use this as a chance to reminisce about you know, the things they've learned through other crises and what they feel like they've learned from this experience in terms of you know, you know, kind of the perspective they have on the value of their family, of connection, of the creativity that they may have had. Um, and they will reminisce about how they will incorporate this particular experience you know, into their life. I think one of the biggest risks during this kind of extended set of restrictions is that people wait until it's over to kind of get back to normal instead of trying to integrate the things that have meaning and value to them into their day to day, whether that's picking up the phone and talking to someone about what they miss about them, as opposed to waiting until they can reconnect again. I think that's one of the shifts that I'm hoping people will make, because I think early on, we all thought it would be over in maybe a few weeks or a few months and we just waited. And I think now it's really time to stop waiting and think about what could we do that's kind of the most connected to who we are. Um, so we're living in the moment rather than waiting for the normal to come back. But let me do a quick follow up with you. For example, talking to that sandwich generation who are dealing with older parents and also their own children, um, give them some advice. If, if their parents say to them, look, I know you're looking out for my health but we can't stand the isolation and, and you need to, you and Dr. Williams and Premier Ford, you've all got to back off a bit and let us live our lives a little more. The response to that should be what? 
I think the response to that can be, you know, kind of, mom, I'm, I'm worried about you and I'm sorry if I've done anything to kind of make you feel like you should be, you know, restricting yourself in a way that, you know, makes you feel lonely. Let's talk a little bit about how we might be able to meet in the middle because, you know, I need to feel like I'm doing my best for you out of love. And I know you also need to live your life. Let's figure out, you know, how, how I can stop constraining you, but also how, you know, I can cope with what I, what I hope doesn't happen. And I don't want to have to kind of reflect and, and regret some things that I either allowed or kind of tolerated. And I think what I would say to the, the, those uh, folks that you're wanting to give a script to is let's watch our own language and be careful that we're not infantilizing, you know, our parents and our grandparents and really try to respect that they're also really speaking up and telling us what's important to them. And Nathan Stolen, our last minute and change here. Could, could you tell us whether you are hearing anything from the upper levels of Public Health Ontario or the Premier's office or anything like this, which suggests that they understand the nuances of the conversation we've had tonight and that they may be rethinking or reevaluating the, and I'm going to use a bad word here, so you give me the right word, the, the kind of paternalistic approach that they've taken, which is we're going to decide what's good for everybody and there are not many shades of gray in all of this. Are you hearing anything about that? Well, I think... You know, the, the visitor policy that I spoke about, about welcoming back caregivers in, in early September, uh, reflected the fact that they listened to advice that uh, our group gave and that several other groups across the province and the country gave about recognizing that residents need their caregivers and that not all people trying to enter long-term care homes are there for social reasons. So the fact that they implemented a more progressive visitor policy that exists in many different jurisdictions of the world gave me a lot of hope that they were receptive to this. Um, the other thing to, to recognize is um, there's a concept of shielding, which has been proposed, uh, where you try and allow transmission of COVID-19 in the community and, and try and shield the more vulnerable population. Um, that has not worked in any jurisdiction. There's no empiric evidence that you're able to effectively do that. We're seeing that here in Ontario as well, where less than a quarter of all cases are in people 60 years of age and older, but they account for about two-thirds of the hospitalizations and more than 95% of the deaths. And I think recently as well, um, after we had some, I would argue, dithering and delays in terms of uh, implementing more uh, or implementing public health policy that, that acted to more aggressively suppress the virus, I think there's a recognition that that's not going to work as well. So I do think that they have been receptive when they have needed to be. Has it always been on time? No, unfortunately. Okay. Dr. Weisenfeld, let's finish up on this. How... How would you expect seniors, or how well would you be able to expect seniors to shake off that frail label that they have mm. essentially been told they are for the last nine months? Oh, I, I, it's hard to know, but I actually am worried about it. I think it's going to be tough. I think that, you know, any time there's a kind of prolonged, uh, you know, really kind of traumatic experience where, you know, someone's sort of self-concept of being vulnerable has really... Um, you know, shifted and, you know, persisted for so long, especially as people are already in an older age category, I think it's going to be difficult. I think that there's a real risk, you know, even once there's a vaccine and even once the COVID-19 situation, you know, has, you know, kind of shifted that, you know, this experience, like all experiences, will really kind of sit, you know, with people. We all get imprinted on all of the things that have happened to us. Um, and, you know, I think for someone you know, who spent, you know, nine months, 12 months really kind of having it hit home to them that they're in the vulnerable group. Uh, it may be really hard for them to ever really think of themselves um, as as robust as they might have been thinking about themselves in, you know, February of, of 2020. So I think there's going to be some work to do, which I hope we can all do both in healthcare and in public health around, you know, shifting the messaging and encouraging people to really kind of re reclaim, you know, their lives again, you know, rather than, you know, kind of look back, you know, years from now and see this as the time when, you know, older people, you know, shifted into, a, you know, a kind of level of almost post-COVID isolation uh, way too early. So I think that it's going to be important for all of us as healthcare providers, as daughters, as, you know, public health advisors to really recognize that there'll be some post-COVID effects that, we really want to attend to in our in our public health messaging around encouraging people to get out again and engage again. Um, I mean, I'm 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 cautiously optimistic that we have the abilities to do so. I just think it needs to be really purposeful and intentional rather than just assuming everything's going to snap back to normal.
You know, I really want to thank you three for coming on here and having a conversation that uh, apparently is long overdue and really helpful, I'm sure, mm -hmm. to the people who are watching this. Leslie Weisenfeld, Nathan Stahl, Christina Frangu, thanks so much for being on TVO with us tonight. Much appreciated. Thank you for having us. The Agenda with Steve Pakin is brought to you by the Chartered Professional Accountants of Ontario. CPA Ontario is a regulator, an educator, a thought leader, and an advocate. We protect the public. We advance our profession. We guide our CPAs. We are CPA Ontario. And by viewers like you. Thank you.